And uh, Satoshi said, withdraw your wealth from an economy that is corrupt. Um, in essence, Satoshi is saying that, that to the extent that you, you could build a multi-billion dollar company, you could generate hundreds of millions or billions of dollars of uh, profits, but if someone is elected that then triples the money supply, they steal two thirds of all your labor for the last 30 years, and they do it in about a week. When the government prints more money, it increases the money supply and circulation, which can lead to inflation. Inflation is the general increase in prices of goods and services in an economy over time. When there is too much money in circulation and the supply of goods and services remains constant, the value of each unit of currency decreases. This is what has happened in the United States, Canada, and many countries of the world, where the government has printed huge sums of money in a short amount of time without a corresponding increase in the supply of goods and services. Printing more money by the government can cause citizens to be poorer in several ways. 1. Inflation when the government prints more money, it leads to an increase in the money supply, which can cause inflation. As prices of goods and services rise, the purchasing power of the currency decreases and citizens need more money to buy the same goods and services they used to buy for less. This decrease in purchasing power can lead to a decrease in the standard of living for citizens. 2. Reduce savings. Inflation can also lead to a decrease in the value of savings. For example, if a citizen saves $1,000, but due to inflation, the value of the currency decreases by 10%, the savings will only be worth $900 in terms of purchasing power. This can discourage citizens from saving money and lead to a reduction in investment and long-term economic growth. 3. Increase interest rates. When inflation increases, the central bank may raise interest rates to control it. This can make it more expensive for citizens to borrow money for homes, cars, or education. Higher interest rates can lead to reduced investment and economic activity, which can negatively impact citizens' employment and income. 4. Lower investment and economic growth. High inflation and reduced investment can lead to a decrease in economic growth. The government may also have to spend more money on debt payments, leaving less money for infrastructure, education, and social services, which can impact citizens' welfare. This is where Bitcoin can come in to save people from the debasement of fiat currency by the government. In this video, we will listen to Michael Saylor's argument on why Bitcoin is so important in the preservation of wealth. Before we listen to him, please smash the like button and subscribe to the channel if you are yet to do so. If, uh, if someone can, in essence, steal everything you've done and everything you're ever going to do with the click of a button, then you can't win by playing that game. And so John Galt kind of said, well, we know we can't win no matter how hard we try, so we should just withdraw and go and strike. And Satoshi took a different point of view, which is, which is, yeah, we know we can't win as long as we hold the currency of, of a corrupt government. So the only way to win is to create an, uh, an immortal, incorruptible currency. And of course, the only way to make an incorruptible or immortal currency is to get the people out of the way. And so in essence, you end up with millions and millions of disinterested computers that can't do anything but process the protocol. And there is no discretion of a CEO or a corporation or a government in the mix of it. But both of them, you know, are heroic figures that, that said, you're in a no-win situation as long as you stay in a corrupt system, you need to depart the system. They had, uh, they, one of them, you know, gives a, a solution of gulch, gulch and strike, and the other one gives a solution of shift your money to cyberspace. Bitcoin yeah. is reared in steel. Mm. It's, it's the wow. hardest wow. material. Reared in steel was the hardest metal in the world, mm. and small Bitcoin, the asset, is the hardest asset in the world to build an economic structure. And then the network, the big Bitcoin network is the John Galt line, uh, some, a, a network to transport value built of Reardon Steel. And, um, you know, if you think about all of the, the systems that are going into this, we're really building a machine, right? And Galt is all about that great machine, the motor, right? We're, we're building a motor to drive the economy uh, to uh, a new level of productivity. Ultimately, if you believe in 
the prosperity of the human race or progress or the future of civilization, it's all going to come down to the ability to construct a machine to channel that energy more efficiently than we have in the past. And I think in, in both Atlas Shrugged and in the modern Bitcoin ecosystem, you have engineers building machines to channel energy. The only difference is uh, in Atlas Shrugged, they don't have an easy mechanism to integrate the machine, you know, into the, into the nation and, and you have politicians seizing the lines and seizing the assets. Whereas, whereas with Bitcoin, the machine is spreading everywhere in the world outside of the control of the politicians and the corporations and the centralized governments. And I, I actually think that the Bitcoin network uh, will uh, succeed where maybe the John Galt line was a bit more of a and, heavy and lift. Michael Saylor also talks about the unique features of Bitcoin. Bitcoin is decentralized because it operates on a peer-to-peer -peer network, which means that there is no central authority or intermediary controlling it. This is different from traditional currencies, which are usually controlled by central banks or governments. In a decentralized system like Bitcoin, transactions are processed and verified by a network of computers, known as nodes, rather than a central authority. These nodes work together to maintain a secure and transparent ledger of all Bitcoin transactions called the blockchain. The decentralized nature of Bitcoin provides several benefits. Let's listen more to Michael Saylor. Bitcoin represents um, a decentralized crypto security network, the most secure network in the world. And the two characteristics it has is, is it's most secure to attack in the near term and it has the most integrity or durability over the next thousand years. So something that's anchored in that can be separate from and not dependent on a government, a corporation, or, uh, or any one individual. Now, on top of that, we're seeing open, neutral, permissionless protocols like Lightning, not owned by anybody, that have a million times the performance and functionality and people have been building a lot of applications on that. The, the obvious ones are payment applications, like I move money back and forth a million times a minute. Uh, but the other is people have been working on chat applications and podcasting applications and the like. I think that you'll see, um, you, you'll see that um, a decentralized crypto network that, um, that is transnational and neutral can serve as the foundation for other applications, but they will come later on the, on the other layers. And uh, th there's a lot of exciting stuff in that area if you follow what, uh, you know, what Bitfinex is doing with Keat and some of the other Lightning apps. Uh, how they end up, it's unclear. I'm, I'm also, though, of the opinion that there's a lot of very compelling applications that can be built on top of either even centralized apps somewhere in the world if they had a decentralized monetary network to plug into to power them. So uh, the jury is still out about how all that will develop, but, but maybe the last point, the, there's a corruption of the economy I mean, there's a corruption of the economy where, you know, you, you have many centralized organizations that are subject to nation state capture and you don't have free speech, you don't have free action and the like. The way to fix the problem is not, to, not by fixing the captured entities. You can't fix the Googles and the Facebooks and the Apples and the, and the Twitters directly without fixing the money first. So the, the right order is fix the monetary layer because that's the pure energy layer. Then you can start to fix some of the transaction layers. And then after that, you can fix the application layers, but it has to be in that order because the other order, um, the other order would be, I've tried to create a virtuous reformed company, but then of course the politicians and governments just shut it down and they deplatform it and it goes to zero. So, We've seen that happen a lot. So you can't go the other direction. You really have to focus on fundamentals. And the fundamental thing is energy. The universe runs on energy. Until you create neutral, open, permissionless digital energy, 
you can't create anything of beauty and substance and durability above it or, or in, in addition to it. It has to be that order, I think. Bitcoin offers several advantages over fiat currency. It operates on a decentralized network, which eliminates the need for a central authority or intermediary. This provides several benefits, including increased security, greater transparency, and a higher degree of privacy and anonymity. Transactions are secured through advanced cryptographic techniques, and fees are generally lower than those for fiat currency transactions, particularly for international transactions. Additionally, Bitcoin is accessible to anyone with an internet connection, regardless of their location or financial status. It also has a limited supply with only 21 million Bitcoins that can ever exist. This makes it a deflationary currency that could appreciate in value over time. What do you make of Michael Saylor's video? Please let's hear your opinion in the comment below. Thanks for watching and please stay savvy.